Okay, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to continue with our lecture on quantum mechanics. Now in the last video, I told you about some of the history and some of the developments that led up to quantum mechanics. So in this video, we're actually going to get into quantum mechanics itself. What does the theory say? Now, something called a wave function is a really important feature of quantum mechanics. It comes up all the time. So what we're going to do today in this lecture is define what a wave function is and how you can use it to make different calculations. But before we get into that, um, we need to talk a little bit about the math that goes into it. Because wave functions generally have complex values. What I mean by that is if you plug a number into a wave function, in general, what's going to pop out is a complex number. And a complex number, if you haven't seen this before, is the sum of a real and an imaginary component. So it has this general form, a plus b times i, where i is what's called the imaginary unit. It's equal to the square root of minus 1. And a and b are any two real numbers. So a is the real component, because that's just a real number. And then this b times i part is the imaginary component. So if a and b can take on any values, um, this is just the general form of a complex number. So we also have something called the complex conjugate, which we need to know about. So the complex conjugate of a complex number replaces every instance of i with minus i. That's all it is. So anytime you see the number i, just tack a negative sign onto it. Okay, so let me give you an example of that. If we have z, which is a complex number, equal to 3 plus 4i, then z star, which denotes the complex conjugate of this number, just is 3 minus 4 times i. So in other words, we leave the real part alone, but then for the imaginary part, we just flip the sign, right? So that's how you take the complex conjugate. The reason we care about the complex conjugate of a number is that if we ever take a complex number and then multiply it by its complex conjugate, we always get a real positive number, okay? So it's basically like taking the magnitude of a complex number in some sense. So let me show you this example. Uh, let's say we have the same complex number as before. That's z, which is equal to uh, 3 plus 4i. What I'm going to show you is that z star times z so that's the complex conjugate of z multiplied by z. Sometimes we denote this as just z magnitude squared like this. This is what we mean when we write this. Uh, it's going to equal 25. Okay, so let's work that out. Okay, so in this example, we have the complex number z, which is equal to 3 plus 4i. And then the complex conjugate of that number, z star, is 3 minus 4i. So what we're trying to calculate here is z magnitude squared. And when we're dealing with complex numbers, that doesn't just mean take the number z and square it. It means actually do z star times z. Okay? All right, so we can just plug in the numbers. We have 3 minus 4i, that's z star, and then we have 3 plus 4i. And what we're going to do is expand this using FOIL. Remember the FOIL method? So you take the first term, which is 3 times 3. Okay. And you take the outside terms and multiply them. So that's going to be uh, 3 times 4i. Then you take the inside terms and multiply them. That's minus 4i times 3. And then you take the last terms and multiply. So that's going to be minus 4i times 4i. So notice the middle two terms here and here are just uh, the negative of one another. So they cancel out. And then what we're left with is 3 squared uh, for the first term. And then for the second term, we have minus... 4 squared multiplying i squared. But remember, i is just equal to the square root of minus 1. So that means i squared is minus 1. So really, we have 3 squared plus 
4 squared because the two negative signs will cancel. And um, yeah, that's just 9 plus 16, which is 25. So what we could say is the magnitude of z is 5 because we would just, you know, square root that to get the magnitude of z. So this is a lot like taking the magnitude of a vector, if you think about it. Because if I had a vector where the two components were 3 and 4, the magnitude would be 5, right? So it's just like that, but with complex numbers. So here's an example for you to try out at home. A complex number has the form z equals a plus bi, where a and b are both real numbers. Suppose that a is equal to 2 and that the magnitude of z squared, which again is z star z, is equal to 8. So based on that, I want you to tell me, what are the two possible values of the coefficient b? So try to work it out, pause the video, see if you can get it, then we'll go through it together. All right, so here's what's going on. We have a complex number z, which has the general form a plus b times i. We do not know what the value of b is, but we know what the value of a is. a is equal to 2. So I'll write this as 2 plus b times i. We also know that the magnitude of z squared, which again is z star z, that's equal to 8. Okay, so let's write out what z star z is equal to. This is equal to 2 minus bi, so that would be the complex conjugate, times 2 plus bi. That's just the original complex number, all right? And again, we can FOIL this out just like before. With the first term, we have 2 times 2. With the uh, outside term, we have 2 times bi. With the inside term, we have minus bi times 2. And with the last term, we have minus bi times bi. Just like before, these two middle terms cancel. And what we get is 2 squared, which is 4 for the first term. And for the second term, we have minus b squared times i squared. But remember, i squared is minus 1. So this is just 4 plus b squared, okay? So that's the value of z star times z. But if this is equal to 8, then what we have is 4 plus b squared is equal to 8. So subtract 4 from both sides, and we get b squared equals 4. And so then b should be equal to the plus or minus root of 4, okay? So that could be plus or minus 2. So there's the answer. It's plus or minus 2. So we're now ready to define what a wave function is. So if we have a particle that's moving in one dimension, let's say it's moving along the x-axis, the wave function is going to be given by psi of x. This is the Greek letter psi. So the input for this function is an x value, and x represents a position. The output, the value of psi that gets spit out, is a complex number, generally speaking. So that's what I was saying earlier. Wave functions generally have complex values to them. So how do we interpret the value of the wave function? How do we interpret the number that it spits out when we plug in a position? Well, that's where the Born rule comes in. So this is something that was discovered by the physicist Max Born. And it states that the wave function is related to probabilities, okay? In particular, the probability of the particle being located within some infinitesimal interval, x to x plus dx, so this is saying the probability of locating the particle within this window right here, is given by psi star x times psi of x times dx. So in other words, we take the complex conjugate of the wave function, times the wave function itself, and then times that interval dx. That's going to give us the probability of finding the particle within that interval. 
Okay, so that's all good, but that's not generally how we're gonna make calculations of probabilities. In general, what we wanna know is, what is the probability that the particle is located within some finite interval? Let's say x a to x b. In order to do that, we need to perform an integral, okay? So this says the probability of finding our particle between position x a and position x b is the integral between the limits x a to x b of psi star x times psi x dx. And this whole thing right here, the psi star times psi, can be written in a more compact way as the magnitude of psi squared, as we've seen before. So usually we'll write things like this. The integral from x a to x b of the wave function squared times dx. But remember, since we're talking about complex numbers, we know when we square something, it's really the complex conjugate times the wave function itself. That's what it means. Okay, so the nice thing about this is psi generally has complex values, right? If you plug in a value of x into the wave function, generally what you're gonna get out is some kind of complex number. But when you calculate a probability using the wave function in this sort of way, you're always gonna get a real and positive number, okay? So probabilities are always gonna have real positive values, even though they're calculated from wave functions, which have, generally speaking, complex values. So let's talk a little bit more about probabilities and what they mean. So in general, probabilities range in between zero and one. A probability of zero represents an event that can never happen, so it's impossible. And a probability of one represents an event that must always happen, something that's inevitable. Let's think about this in the context of our wave functions. So remember, if we take the square of our wave function and then we integrate that in between two positions, that gives us the probability that our particle will be located in between those two positions. But the thing is, our particle has to be located somewhere in space, right? Even though if we don't know exactly where it is, we know it's located somewhere in space between x equals minus infinity and x equals positive infinity. In fact, if we write the probability that our particle is somewhere in between minus infinity and positive infinity, that has to equal one, okay? So in other words, if we take our wave function and we square it, and then we integrate that between minus infinity and positive infinity, that has to equal one. That's just another way of saying the particle is located somewhere, right? And this places a constraint on our wave function. It's called the normalization condition. So if you integrate the wave function over all space, and that equals one, we say the wave function is normalized. And all wave functions have to be normalized to give you the right kinds of probabilities. So before you make a calculation with your wave function, you always have to make sure that it's normalized. And again, that just means the integral of psi squared over all space is equal to one. You can't properly make calculations unless you have a normalized wave function. Okay, so let's do an example. We have a one dimensional wave function and we're gonna use it to calculate some probabilities. So here's what's going on. The wave function for an electron moving in one dimension is given by psi of x equals some constant c times one minus i x. That's our wave function. And notice how it has a complex number in it, so it has complex values. That's what our wave function is in between x equals zero and x equals one, okay? But our wave function is just equal to zero everywhere else. So again, it takes on this form in the range zero to one, but it's just equal to zero everywhere else. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna find the normalization constant C. So we're gonna find the value of C that's necessary to make our wave function normalized. And then once we've done that, we're gonna calculate the probability of locating this electron between x equals zero and x equals a half. And then we're gonna calculate the probability of locating the electron between x equals a half and x equals one, all right? So let's work this out. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is find the normalization constant. 
and that's uh, C in our wave function. Okay, so what's the condition for our wave function to be normalized? It's that if we take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of psi of x squared dx, which by the way is the same as the integral from minus infinity to positive infinity of psi star x times psi x, that's what we mean, times dx, uh, this should equal 1. Okay, that's the normalization condition. So basically, if we apply this condition to our wave function, uh, we're going to find the value of c. Okay, so I just want to remind you that in our case, our wave function psi of x is equal to c times 1 minus i times x. That's our wave function. So what's the complex conjugate of our wave function? What's psi star of x? Well, that's going to be c times 1 plus ix. That's generally what we have, right? So in other words, just flip the sign on the imaginary component, right? Okay. The other thing about this wave function is that it only has this value between x equals 0 and x equals 1. And outside of that range, the wave function is just equal to 0, right? So really, we don't need to integrate between minus infinity to plus infinity. We just need to integrate between 0 and 1 because the wave function is just equal to 0 everywhere else. So let's do that. We have the integral between 0 and 1. And then we have psi star x. Okay, that's uh, c times 1 plus ix. And then we have psi of x. That's c times 1 minus ix times dx. Now, there's a constant c, which is actually being squared here. So I can pull that out of the integral, c squared. Then we have the integral from 0 to 1. Okay, I have this term right here, which is 1 plus ix, times this term right here, which is 1 minus ix. So we can work that out, but basically, if we use the FOIL method, we're going to have 1 times 1 for the first term. And then for the outside term, we're going to have 1 times uh, minus ix. And then for the inside term, we're going to have uh, ix times 1. And then for the last term, we're going to have ix times minus ix. So that's the whole uh, FOIL expanded out. And then this is multiplied by dx. But again, this becomes a lot simpler than what it looks because this term and this term cancel. Uh, if we look at this term right here, it's basically minus i squared times x squared. And that's just the same as x squared because minus i squared is just equal to 1. All right? So, what do we have here? We have c squared times the integral between 0 and 1 of 1 plus x squared. That's it. Times dx. Okay? And we can do that integral. It's not too bad. Um, if you integrate 1, that becomes x. And if you integrate x squared, that becomes one-third x cubed. So that's just using the power rule. And to include the entire range of positions where the particle could actually be, that's just 0 to 1. Okay? So we're just taking that between 0 and 1. Okay, so plug in the limits. We get c squared. Plug in the top limit, which is 1. And get 1 plus a third times 1 to the third power. Now, if you plug in the bottom limit of 0, you just get 0. So just say minus 0. So this is c squared times 1 plus a third. That's 4 thirds. So remember, this whole integral we just did has to equal 1 for the wave function to be normalized. 
So we have c squared times 4 thirds has to equal 1. Okay, that means c squared has to equal 3 quarters. And if we square root, we have c is equal to the square root of 3 over the square root of 4, which is 2. Now, technically, this could be positive or negative, but let's just choose the positive version of this. And that's our normalization constant. Okay, so we got that down. Next, let's use our wave function now that we know the normalization constant. And let's calculate the probability... of locating the particle in between um, x equals 0 and x equals 1 half. Okay, so what's the probability that it's somewhere in that range? So for this, we're going to use the general idea that the probability of locating the particle between, let's say, two limits xa and xb okay, is equal to the integral between xa and xb of psi squared dx. Okay, so in this case, we're going to make our limits 0 to 1 half. And then what is psi squared? You know, we already kind of did this work up here. Let me just sort of point to it. We already determined that it has this sort of form. It's c squared and then 1 plus x squared. All right, we already worked that out, so I'm going to kind of use that. So we have c squared 1 plus x squared dx. And we already know the value of c, right? We, we calculated that as root 3 over 2. And that's a constant, so it can come out of the integral. Uh, so we'll have root 3 over 2 squared, and then the integral from 0 to the half of 1 plus x squared dx. That should do it, right? Okay, so when we square uh, root uh, 3 over 2, we get 3 quarters. So I'm going to write 3 quarters. And then we have... Uh, the integral of 1 plus x squared. Well, that, that's just the same thing as before, right? That's just x plus 1 third x cubed, okay? But now we're not evaluating this over all space. We're just going from 0 to a half. So now we're just taking this between 0 and 1 half. Okay, so let's plug in those limits. We have 3 quarters. Uh, so plug in... The top limit, which is a half, so we have a half plus a third times a half to the third power. Now, just like before, if we plug in zero as our bottom limit, we just get zero out. So I'll just write it as minus zero. And uh, yeah, let's just work with this fraction a little bit. We have three quarters out front. And then uh, we have a half. Okay. And then we have a half to the third power times a third. So a half to the third power is one eighth. And then if you take one eighth times one third, you get one over 24. So this is a half plus uh, one over 24 in the brackets. Um, let's try to simplify that. We have three quarters. Okay, so a half is the same as 12 over 24. So we're basically doing 12 over 24 plus 1 over 24 uh, in the brackets, which is the same as 13 over 24. Okay. Uh, okay, then we have uh, some simplification we can do. Uh, 3 divided by 24 is the same as an eighth. Okay, and then we're left with 13 over 4 after we do that. And then 8 times 4 is 32. So we have 13 over 32. It's probably easier just to think of this as a decimal. So if you compute 13 over 32, 
what you get is 0 0.40625. That's our probability right there. And you don't have to do all this stuff with the fractions. I just wanted to work it out. Okay, you can just, you know, punch it in to your calculator at this step and get this number out. Anyway, let's now do the other question, which is, what is the probability of locating the particle in between x equals a half and x equals one. So there's like two ways we could do this really. Um, there's a sort of shortcut, which is to say, look, the probability of the particle being between zero and one is equal to one because it can only be located between zero and one in this case, because the wave function is equal to zero everywhere else. Right? So we can just say, look, the probability that we're looking for here is just one minus the probability we found earlier, which is 13 over 32. So one minus 13 over 32 is, okay, one is 32 over 32, minus 13 over 32. 32 minus 13 is 19. So this is 19 over 32. And as a decimal, this is point five nine three seven five in other words the two probabilities that we calculated have to add up to one right uh so we can kind of shortcut it that way you could also do this you could also say look the probability just like before is the integral okay between in this case one half and one of our wave function uh, psi squared dx, right? And you could go through that whole integral and take all those steps, but it would just result in this, okay? So that's how you do this one. Okay, so here's a conceptual question for you guys to think about. The graph below depicts the wave function of an electron. This wave function just happens to only have real values. So what you see here is x is our position. That's what's on the uh, horizontal axis. And then psi of x, that's the value of our wave function, that's on the vertical axis. Okay, so the question is, where is the electron most likely to be located? And where is the electron least likely to be located? Think about it, pause the video for a second, see what you come up with, and then we'll talk about it. All right, so here's what you should have found. You should have found that where the particle is most likely to, bo uh, to be located is x equals 7. So remember, if we take the square of the wave function, that gives us the probability of the particle being located very close to some position, right? So the square of the wave function is biggest at x equals 7. So that's where our particle is most likely to be located. Where our particle is least likely to be located is where the square of the wave function has the smallest value. Well, that actually can be zero. So the, the square of the wave function equals zero at x equals two, x equals four, and then again at x equals 10. So it's actually zero probability for locating the particle at x equals two, x equals four, x equals 10. So that's least likely. And then again, most likely is where the wave function peaks the most, and that's at x equals uh, Seven. All right, so now we know some of the mathematics behind wave functions, and that's all well and good and useful, but it's worth pausing for a second to think about what this all means, because it's very strange if you think about it for a second. So prior to making a measurement, the wave function, psi of x for some particle, describes that particle as being spread out over many possible positions. So for example, let's take this graph at the bottom of the page. Um, it's showing the wave function psi of x on the vertical axis and the position x on the horizontal axis. And we have sort of a bell curve shape here. So, so where this curve peaks, that's the most probable position uh, to find the particle, but we could still potentially find it out here or out here, it's just less probable, right? And 
notably, the particle doesn't have some definite position. There's not one value of x where we could say the particle is located. It's sort of spread out over all of these potential positions. It's only when we make a measurement that we find the particle in some definite position, okay? So prior to making a measurement, the particle is spread out over many different possible positions. But when we make a measurement, we always locate it at some definite position, right? When we make a measurement, we never say, oh, I measured the particle here and here, right? No, we always measure the particle to be located at one exact position. So after measurement, now the particle is in some kind of definite position. And if we were to sort of plot what the wave function looks like, it just means it would be zero everywhere, except for that one position where we actually located the particle. So it's really sharply peaked right there and zero everywhere else. This is known as the collapse of the wave function because we go from the wave function being spread out over many possible positions to being located at one particular position, okay? That's the collapse of the wave function. And it's something we'll talk about a little bit more towards the end of the lecture. But here's what you should take away from this. The outcome of any particular measurement that you make is completely random and unpredictable. You, you don't know what's gonna happen when you make a measurement of a quantum system. You don't know what you're gonna get in advance. It's random. But what you can know is the probability of various different outcomes, okay? Those probabilities are given by the square of the wave function. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to get into is the fact that wave functions can be expressed in more than one way. We can write our wave function as psi of x, where the input is a position, or we can express it like this, psi of p, where the input is now the particle's momentum. So this is what we call the wave function in momentum space. Now, it works really the same way as psi of x. If we integrate this, we get a probability, but we're not talking about the probability of locating the particle somewhere. Now, we're talking about the probability of the particle having a certain momentum value. So in particular, the probability of the particle having a momentum between PA and PB is given by this. It is the integral from PA to PB of psi star P times psi P dP, which we can write as psi P squared, right? Integrated again between PA and PB. So when we take the position space wave function, and we do this sort of integral, again, it gives us a probability of locating the particle between two positions. When we take the momentum space wave function, and we now integrate it between two values of momentum, now it's giving us the probability of the particle having a momentum in that range, okay? So we can go from one to the other. We can go from psi of x to psi of p and vice versa. And the way we do that is by computing something called a Fourier transform. Now, don't worry, we're not actually going to use this in this class. It's a little beyond, you know, physics 47. But I'm just going to put it here just for reference, okay? So we can take a wave function from position space, x, into momentum space, p, by making this calculation. We have psi of p, that's what we're trying to find out, is 1 over 2 pi h bar under the radical. And then we integrate from minus infinity to infinity, psi x e to the minus ipx over h bar dx, okay? So if we perform that integral, we've converted from position space to momentum space. So just know there is a way to do that, okay? But let's take a look at an example, okay? Let's say we have the wave function for a particle in momentum space. And it's given by psi of p equals i times c times p to the third power. That's for uh, momentum values between minus one and one. And let's say it's zero everywhere else, okay? So for this particular wave function, let's find the value of the normalization constant c. And then let's answer these questions. What is the probability of finding this particle with a momentum between zero and one. 
And what is the probability that this particle has a momentum between minus one and zero? So pause the video for a second, see if you can work these out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start by finding the normalization constant. So a wave function in momentum space, just like a wave function in position space, has to be normalized. So what that means is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of psi of p squared dp has to equal 1. Because whatever the momentum is, it's somewhere between minus infinity and infinity, right? So the probability of that is 1. That's, that's the idea. Okay, so in our case, our wave function psi of p, what was that equal to? It was um, i times c times p cubed. So that means psi star of p, the complex conjugate, is just that whole thing with a negative sign, right? Because we replace i with minus i. All right, so what we're doing then is we're taking the integral from minus infinity to infinity, but actually we're just needing to do minus one to one because the wave function is equal to zero outside of that range. So I should just note this is for b having values between minus one and one. And again, the complex conjugate is minus i times c times p to the third. And then the wave function itself is i times c times p to the third. And then we multiply that by dp. All right. So what do we have here? We have minus i times i. What is that? That's minus i squared, but i squared is minus 1, so that's just 1. Okay, so I'm just showing you that if we take minus i times i, we just get 1. Okay, cool. And then we have c times c, so that's c squared, and that's a constant, so that can come out. And then all that we're left with is p cubed times p cubed, which is p to the 6. And that's multiplying dp, and we're going from minus 1 to 1 for this integral. Okay, so that's not so bad. This is just the power rule. Uh, if we integrate p to the 6 power, what do we get? We get 1 over 7 times p to the 7th power. And then that c squared is out front. And again, we're going to evaluate this between minus 1 and 1. So what does that equal? Um, that's c squared. Okay, and then we have 1 seventh. And then we take 1 to the seventh power. And then we have minus 1 over 7. And then we take minus 1 to the seventh power. Okay, minus 1 to the seventh power is just minus 1. So really, this is just 1 seventh minus negative 1 seventh, which is just a seventh plus a seventh, which is 2 sevenths, right? 2 over 7. So this is c squared times 2 over 7. And remember, this has to equal 1. So c squared times 2 over 7 is equal to 1. And uh, what we get is c squared is equal to 7 over 2. And that means c is the square root of that. So square root of 7 over 2. Technically, this could be negative 2. Uh, we're just going to choose the positive value. doesn't matter. OK, so there's our normalization constant. OK, so next, let's calculate the probability of having momentum somewhere in the range, somewhere between um, <clears throat> p equals 0 and p equals 1. All right, so remember the way this works is the probability of the momentum being somewhere between two values, let's call them pa and pb, like this, is equal to the integral over the limits pa to pb, 
of psi of p squared. So it's the square of our momentum space wave function. All right, but that's something we've already, uh, you know, evaluated in this first part. Let me just point to it right here. That's the square of our wave function. It's the c squared out front, because that's a constant. We could pull it out. Now we're taking the limits to be 0 to 1, okay? Different limits from before. But what's inside the integral is p to the 6th power times dp. So I already showed you how that works, right? Okay, cool. So uh, what do we have? We have c squared. That's, okay, the square root of... Sorry, let me rewrite that. That's the square root of 7 over 2. Square that. And then take the integral from 0 to 1 of p to the 6th power dp, right? All right, so square root, then you square it. You just get what's in the square root back. You have 7 halves. Um, when you do this integral, you get 1 over 7 times p to the 7th power. And again, we're, we're evaluating that between 0 and 1. The sevens cancel, we just have one half out front when we do that. And then we have one to the seventh power and then minus zero, but, you know, one to the seventh power, that's just one. So what do we get? We get one half. So the probability that the momentum is somewhere between zero and one is a half. So it's a 50-50 sort of chance. Okay. Now, what is the probability of having some kind of momentum in between, uh, let's write it as p equals minus one and p equals zero. Well, in this case, the wave function is zero outside of the range p equals minus one to one. So in other words, we know the momentum is somewhere between minus one and one with 100% probability, right? So really, we don't need to calculate a whole integral again. We could just say the probability we're looking for is just one minus the probability we found before, which is a half. And of course, we'll get a half back if we do that. You can also, you know, grind through the integral. Again, in this case, what you would be doing is you'd be saying, uh, to get this probability, we'd be taking the integral between minus 1 and 0 of the square of our momentum space wave function. Uh, but if you went through all those steps, you'd just end up getting a half. Okay, So that's sort of a shortcut to it. So just to reiterate, the state of a quantum system is described by this thing called a wave function which does not have definite values for position, momentum, or other measurable quantities for that matter. Instead, the wave function gives us probabilities of different outcomes we might get. So it doesn't generally make sense to say that our quantum system has some position or it has some momentum, but what we can do is calculate what's called an expectation value. So the expectation value is the average over many repeated measurements of a quantity, okay? So let's say we want the expectation value for position, let's say. That would be the result of measuring the position of a quantum system many, many, many times, and then taking the average over all those different measurements. We can actually calculate the expectation value for position like this. So the expectation value for x, our position, which is denoted by x in these brackets, is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x times psi of x squared dx. So we're not just taking the square of the wave function and integrating that. We're taking x times the square of the wave function and integrating that over all space. That gives us the expectation value for position. In other words, if we made many, many measurements of the position and averaged over all those measurements, 
this is what we would get. We can do a similar sort of thing for momentum, the expectation value for momentum, which is P in the brackets, is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of P times psi P squared dP. That's how we do it. Let's do an example of this. The wave function for a particle in one dimension is given by this. Psi of x is equal to eight divided by pi to the one fourth power times e to the minus x squared for x between zero and infinity. And the wave function is zero everywhere else. So first of all, what's with this weird set of constants out front? It turns out that's the normalization constant you need for the wave function to be normalized. And um, let's take a look at what our wave function looks like when we plot it. So again, we have psi of x on the vertical axis and we have x on the horizontal axis. Uh, we're saying psi of x is going to be zero for basically all negative values of x. So it's just going to be zero up until we get to this point. And then after that, it's going to be given by this function over here. This is basically a bell curve sort of function. So uh, it sort of drops off and asymptotically approaches zero as x goes to infinity. So what's the expectation value? Well, we know the probability of finding the particle around this region is high, and then the probability of finding the particle around this region is pretty low, but what's the expectation value? What's sort of the average position we'd find it in if we made many measurements? Let's calculate that. All right, so the expectation value for position is in general given by the integral between minus infinity and infinity of x times the wave function in position space squared times dx, all right? Now, normally, we'd have to be careful about how we evaluate this part, the square of the wave function, because we'd have to take the complex conjugate and all that. But in this case, our wave function is only real valued. It doesn't have any uh, imaginary values. So we can literally just take the square of it, and that's it. Also, let's remember that our wave function is equal to zero between minus infinity and zero. So we really only need to do the integral between zero and infinity, okay? So then we have x. Let's put in the wave function itself. That was eight divided by pi to the one fourth power. And then we had e to the minus x squared. And then we're gonna square that whole thing. That's the square of the wave function. And that's multiplying dx. Okay, let's pull out any constants we can. Um, of course, you know, the eight over pi thing, that's a constant, it can be pulled out. Notice if we have eight over pi to the one fourth power and then we square it, uh, that's eight over pi to the one half power, right? So the constant we can pull out is actually eight over pi to the one half power, which is the same thing as taking the square root, by the way. All right, we have that. Then what's in the integral? Uh, we have zero to infinity. Okay, we have an x, and then we have e to the minus x squared, and then we square that. So you gotta be careful with how this works. This actually just brings a factor of two into the exponent, right? So this is the same as e to the minus two x squared, like this, and then times dx. So that's really the integral we have to work out, which is not too bad. There's a trick to this one. It's called a u substitution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let u equal um, 2x squared. Okay, I'm going to substitute in uh, 2x squared, and I'm going to replace that with u. But let's take note of what happens when I take the derivative of u with respect to x, du dx. Uh, well, I'm gonna get four times x, right? Just by the power rule, two x squared, take the derivative, gives you four x, okay? I can rearrange this whole thing and solve for x times dx, okay? So multiply through by dx on both sides, divide through by a quarter, or sorry, divide through by four on both sides, and you'll get x times dx equals a quarter 
times du. So that's nice because in the integral, I have x times dx. I can replace that with one quarter du. And then in the exponent, I basically have u. So I've turned this integral into something much simpler, right? Um, all right, we do have to think about the limits too. Since we're changing our variables from x to u, we have to make sure we get the limits right. So let's do that lower limit. Okay, that's um, x going to zero, right? Okay, if we have zero squared times two, we still get zero back. So as x goes to zero, u also goes to zero. So our, our lower limit is, is still zero. Um, what about our upper limit? So for our upper limit, we're saying as x goes to infinity. Well, if I take, you know, infinity squared times two, I'm being a little sloppy with how I'm saying this, but the u upper limit is still infinity, right? I hope we can see that. Okay, so you wanna just check that that's the case. Sometimes your limits are gonna change when you change variables like this. So anyway, the expectation value for x is now equal to eight over pi to the one half power. Our limits haven't changed. They're still zero to infinity. Okay, the x dx part ended up being one quarter times du. And then the e to the minus uh, 2x squared is now e to the minus u. Like this, that's our u substitution. Uh, let's pull out the factor of one quarter, because that's a constant. So now out front we have one quarter over eight over pi to the one half power. And then all we're left with in the integral is, uh, what do we have? Zero to infinity, e to the minus u, du. Now that's actually a really easy integral to do. Um, this comes out to, I'll just write it down, minus e to the minus u. That's, that's the result of that integration. And then of course we have the constants from before out front. So we have those constants times minus e to the minus u, and then we evaluate that between the limits zero to infinity. Okay, so there's a negative sign from the integration. I'm gonna pull that out to the front. And um, same constants as before. Okay, top limit is e to the minus infinity. Bottom limit is e to the zero. So you should know that e to the minus infinity is gonna be zero. More accurately, we say, um, if I have a negative exponent like this and that negative exponent gets larger and larger, approaches infinity, we approach zero, right? And then you should also know that e to the zero power is equal to one. So what do we have? We have minus one over four times eight over pi to the one half power. And then we have uh, zero minus one, so that's negative one. Well, that negative one will just cancel the negative sign out front. So really overall we have a quarter times eight over pi to the one half power. And that's it. You know, we, we could mess with this, make it look nicer, but if you punch this number into your calculator, um, what you'll get is 0 0.399. So that's the expectation value for this particle's position, okay? Okay, now here's one for you to try. The wave function for a particle in one dimension is given by psi of x equals the square root of three times one minus x. That's the value of the wave function between x equals zero and x equals one. But the wave function is actually just equal to zero everywhere else. Okay, so if we kind of graph this, um, for negative values of x, the wave function is just zero. Uh, all of a sudden it shoots up to some peak over here and then it gradually goes down back to zero at x equals one and then it's just zero from there on. So the only 
place we'd actually ever find the particle is somewhere between zero and one. But it's not equally likely everywhere between zero and one. It's more likely to find it closer to zero and less likely to find it closer to one, right? Because this is where the wave function has the highest value. So we'd expect the expectation value for position is kind of biased this way a little bit. Uh, but let's actually find the actual value. Let's calculate the expectation value for that position. So works the same way as before. Try doing that integral to see if you can get the answer. Pause the video, see what you come up with, and then come back. Okay, so to calculate the expectation value for position, works the same way as before. We have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x times the square of the wave function uh, times dx. All right, for the limits, um, let's think about this. This particular wave function is just zero everywhere outside of the range x equals zero to x equals one. So we really only need to integrate between zero and one because again, the wave function is just zero everywhere else. So then we have x and then we have the square of the wave function. The wave function itself is the square root of three times uh, one minus x. And we can just take the square of that. We don't have to deal with complex conjugates because this, this is just only real values here. There's no i in this expression, right? And then we multiply that by dx. All right. So notice we have square root of three and then we square that. So that's just a factor of three. That's a constant factor. We can pull it out to the front. Okay. Then we have x and then we have uh, 1 minus x squared times dx. So how about we expand uh, 1 minus x squared? Let's expand that out. So we have 3 times the integral between 0 and 1. Then we have x times, okay, we get 1 squared, which is just 1. And we get minus 2x. And then we get plus x squared. That's, hap that's what happens when you expand this, this out right here. Uh, then we have our dx. All right. Now let's just multiply this x into the parentheses. So we have three times integral from zero to one, x minus two x squared, and then plus x cubed times dx. Okay. So this is just a power rule sort of thing. Uh, you know, each one of these terms is just x to some power. Uh, so overall, what we have is 3. If you integrate x, you get 1 half x squared. Okay, if you integrate x squared, you get 1 third x cubed. But then don't forget the minus 2 factor out front. So we have minus 2 thirds x to the third. And then if you integrate x to the third, you get 1 fourth uh, x to the fourth. And we need to evaluate between zero and one, okay? So let's do that. We have three times, uh, we have a half times one squared, and then minus two thirds times one to the third. Um, and then we have plus one fourth times one to the fourth. That's what we get when we plug in the top limit. When we plug in the bottom limit, it should be pretty clear that we just get zero out, right? So I'll just leave that as minus zero. All right, so then we have three times. Let's see what we're dealing with here. We have a half minus two thirds plus a quarter, right? Um, common denominator would be 12, right? So we have three times. Okay, we've got six over 12 is a half. Uh, 8 over 12 is 2 thirds, so we have minus 8 over 12, and then 3 over 12 is a quarter, right? So what do we have overall? We have 6 plus 3, that's 9, and then minus 8, that's 1. So overall, we just have 1 over 12, right? So 3 times 1 over 12. But that's the same as 1 over 4. So just like we expected, the expectation value for position is closer to zero, right? 
Uh, and that's, that's exactly what's going on here. So we've covered everything that you need to know about wave functions for now. So the next step is to take a look at the Schrodinger equation. This is the equation that you would solve if you were trying to actually find the wave function for a given system, if you wanted to calculate what the wave function is. And this equation was discovered by Erwin Schrodinger back in the 1920s. And this is a really famous physicist, made a lot of important contributions to uh, quantum mechanics. So the Schrodinger equation, in a nutshell, governs how the wave function of a particle changes with position and evolves over time. Let's talk about some of the ingredients that go into this equation because it might look a little intimidating at first. So first of all, we have u. u is a function of x and t. So it's a function of position and it could be a function of time as well. This is what we call the potential energy of our particle. And potential energy is something you should be familiar with from back in physics 45. m, that appears in the equation too. That's just the mass of our particle. And of course, we have h bar, that's Planck's constant, the reduced version of Planck's constant. And then, of course, we have psi, the wave function, that's going to appear here as well. But notice that we're using a slightly different symbol for the wave function. This is actually a capital psi. Up until this point, we've been using the lowercase psi. And we use the uppercase psi when we want to denote that this is a function of not only position x, but time as well. So we're allowing the potential energy to depend on both position and time, and we're allowing the wave function to depend on both position and time, okay? So once that's all straight, we can look at the equation. So we have minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x, this is a partial derivative now, of our wave function. So we're only taking the position derivative here. Then we have plus u times psi, so that's just the potential energy times the wave function. And then we have, on the other side of the equation, i times h bar. Now, i is the imaginary unit, so imaginary numbers are fundamentally part of this equation. And then we have the partial derivative with respect to time of the wave function. Okay, so there's a lot going on there, but there's a nice way to interpret all this. So if we notice... Um, the left-hand side of the equation kind of involves the total energy of the particle because we have the potential energy appearing over here, and this term we can associate with the kinetic energy. So really, you want to think of this as like uh, kinetic plus potential energy on this side of the equation. And of course, the wave function is getting mixed up in all that, but it has to do with the total energy of the particle. Then on the right-hand side, we're basically taking the time rate of change of the wave function itself. So we're asking, like, how quickly is the wave function itself changing over time? So a nice way to interpret this is, like, if the left-hand side is bigger, that just indicates that the particle has more energy, more total energy, right? And if the right-hand side is bigger, that means the wave function is changing over time at a faster rate. So what we want to say is, the more energy the particle has, the faster its wave function is changing over time. That's a nice way to interpret this equation. So we're usually not going to use that form of Schrodinger's equation. What I just showed you is what is called the time-dependent Schrodinger equation because it depends on time, right? What we're mostly going to use is something called the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is much simpler because it doesn't depend on time, okay? So when can we sort of simplify things in this way? Well, if the potential energy does not depend on time, that is to say our potential energy U, which we typically think of as being a function of both position and time, right? So it could be changing with position, it could be changing with time. But if we say, nope, it's not changing over time actually, then we have just u of x. So it only depends on position, but it doesn't change over time. That's the idea. If that's the case, then the wave function can be separated out into a spatial component, so something that depends on x, and then a time component, something that depends on t, and those things are separated out. And this is how it works. So capital Psi, 
which is a function of x and time, is equal to lowercase psi, which is only a function of x, times e to the minus i times omega t. Okay, so we can separate out things into the spatial component over here and then the time component over here. Now, what do we make of this omega thing? This is an angular frequency. We've seen this kind of thing before when talking about waves. I actually want to remind you what this frequency is uh, related to. It's related to the energy of our particle. Think back to our first lecture when we went over the de Broglie hypothesis, okay? According to Louis de Broglie, the energy of a particle is equal to h, which is Planck's constant, times its frequency, okay? But we can also write this as h bar times omega. So to show you how that works real quick, remember e is equal to h times f, where e is the total energy of our particle and f is the frequency. Let's remember that omega is just 2 pi times f, so they're just related by a factor of 2 pi. And then h bar is just h divided by 2 pi, so they're also related by a factor of 2 pi. So when we say e is equal to hf, we can kind of rewrite that. We can say h is 2 pi times h bar, and then we can say f is omega divided by 2 pi, and those factors of 2 pi cancel, and we just get h bar omega. So saying e is equal to hf is the same as saying e is equal to h bar omega. Those are equivalent things, so just get used to going back and forth between them. So anyway, that shows this equivalence between these two expressions for the energy. So in the case where our potential energy does not depend on time, it's just u as a function of x, like this, not only do we get this nice result for our wave function that we can split it up into the spatial component and the time component, but we also get a very simplified form of the Schrodinger equation, which is a lot easier to work with. Um, and this is called the time-independent Schrodinger equation because, well, it doesn't depend on time. So here's what that looks like. It's minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x of that spatial component of our wave function, so we're using the lowercase psi for that, plus u of x, that's our potential energy, times our wave function, just the spatial component once again. And that equals e times that same spatial component of the wave function, just like uh, we saw on the other side. So that's the equation we typically have to solve uh, because we're not going to be dealing with any problems where the potential energy is changing over time. Those are just kind of too complicated. So I think the simplest case we could look at is what's called the free particle. So a free particle has no forces acting on it anywhere in space. So no matter where it's located, there's never any force acting on it. And in that kind of situation, we can actually just set the potential energy equal to zero everywhere. Okay, so that gives us a very simple uh, form of the Schrodinger equation. The time-independent Schrodinger equation then becomes, we have minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x of our wave function equals e times our wave function. So remember, the potential energy part would normally go right here, but that's going to be equal to zero. And of course, if the potential energy is just zero, that's not changing over time, so we can use this version of the Schrodinger equation, right? Okay, so I'm not going to attempt to directly solve this equation. Instead, I'm just going to show you a potential solution, and we're just going to verify that it works. So here's my proposal for the solution. We have psi of x equals c times e to the i kx. Okay, let's recall what the Schrodinger equation looks like in this situation. We have minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x. And then the potential energy term is what comes next, but that's just zero for a free particle. And then we have this equaling e times psi. Okay, so that's what the Schrodinger equation looks like for a free particle. Okay, I'm just going to slightly rewrite this. Uh, 
I'm going to take the negative term and throw it over to the other side of the equation so it becomes positive. And then I'm also just going to like divide out all those factors in front of the second derivative. So when you do all that, you can rewrite the equation to look like this. We have the second derivative of psi with respect to x. And then plus uh, 2 times m times e over h bar squared times psi equals 0. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is that my potential solution solves that equation. Okay. And we can show this pretty easily just by taking two derivatives. Okay. So if I take the first derivative of that solution I wrote down, that would be d psi by dx. So I'm taking the derivative of an exponential. So basically, I get back the same exponential as before, but I pull down from the exponent a factor of i times k. So I have i times k times c times e to the i times kx. That would be the first derivative, right? And then the second derivative would just be to take one more derivative. And it works kind of the same way as before, but we're going to pull out another factor of i times k. So overall, we have i times k uh, squared out front times c times e to the i times k times x. And let's just clean that up a little bit. I have an i squared, which is minus 1. And then there's a k squared. And then c times e times i to the kx. Okay. So let's plug that into the Schrodinger equation. Let's plug that in right here. So first we have the second derivative, which is minus k times c times e to the i k x. And then we have plus 2 times m times e. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I should have said k squared for the second derivative, right? It's k squared right here, okay? Anyway, um, then we have 2 times m times e divided by h bar squared times psi, which actually I'm just going to write what psi is, right? That's uh, c times e to the i k x, like this. Okay, so that, that's what I wanted to do. And that should equal 0, okay? Cool. What I can do is divide out a factor of c, so that cancels out across the board. I can also divide out e to the i k x, so that cancels out across the board. And then it looks like what I'm left with is this, k squared equals 2m times e divided by h bar squared. So this is telling us the solution works as long as k squared is equal to that value, as long as it's equal to 2me divided by h bar squared. Okay, so that's a verification that it works, and it also tells us something about that k thing, what the value has to be. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for k. k is equal to the square root of 2me divided by h bar. So basically just square root both sides, right? That's what we get. But we can take this a step further, right? What, what is E? E is the total energy of our particle. It's the kinetic energy plus the potential. That, that's what I mean by k plus u, is kinetic plus potential. Let me just write that down so it doesn't get confusing. This is kinetic, this is potential. Okay, cool. Well, our kinetic energy can be thought of as one half times m times v squared. And again, we're dealing with a free particle, so it does not have any potential energy. That's just zero. So really, it's just the kinetic piece. That's it. And I want to remind you that there's a little trick we can do. We can say uh, this kinetic energy is one over two m, and then that all times m v quantity squared. Okay. And if you look at that mv thing that's appearing, that's the momentum. 
So then I can write this as the momentum, which is P squared over 2M. Okay, so let me take that and sub it in to my K expression, okay? So what do I have? I have 2 times M, and then my energy is P squared divided by 2M, and that's all under the square root, and that's all divided by H bar. Okay, nice. So what do we have? The two m's cancel here and here. And then we have the square root of p squared, such so as p, right? In other words, this is p over h bar. Okay, but I want to remind you of something else we learned. The momentum of a particle p is related to a wavelength. And this is uh, de Broglie's formula. This says P is H over lambda. So this is from uh, De Broglie. Okay. And also I want to remind you that this H bar thing is just H over 2 pi. So I'm going to take these two expressions, oops, and sub them in right here. And this is what we get. Okay, so for P, we have H over lambda. And for H bar, we have H over 2 pi. What does this give us? This just gives us 2 pi divided by lambda. Okay, so this thing that we've been calling K, like this mysterious constant K, is equal to 2 pi over lambda. Well, where have we seen that before? This is what we call the wave number for a sinusoidal wave, okay? So that's how you want to interpret that K that's appearing in our equation, it's a wave number. And so here's our result. The general time independent solution for a particle moving in the positive X direction looks like this. We have psi of X equals C times E to the I K X. C is just a constant, you can think of it kind of like an amplitude, and K, as we just saw, can be interpreted like a wave number. So we showed that k is equal to the square root of 2 times m times e, that's the mass and that's the energy, divided by h bar. But this is equivalent to p divided by h bar, where p is the momentum. And that's also equivalent to 2 pi divided by lambda, where lambda is a wavelength. And so because we get this result, we can think of this like a wave number. Now. This only applies to a free particle moving in the positive x direction, but it's pretty easy to guess what the solution is for a particle moving in the negative x direction. You just pick up a negative sign in this exponent, so we'll get to that later. Okay, so that's the time-independent solution. There's no t involved in this, right? But the time-dependent solution, the one that does involve time, looks like this. We have our psi of x times e to the minus i omega t, okay? That's how we combine the time-independent solution with the time-dependent part to get the full solution, okay? So what does this look like? For psi of x, we have c times e to the i k x, and then we have e to the minus i omega t, and those are being multiplied out. So we have these two exponentials multiplied together. The way we handle this is we can combine them into a single exponential if we just add the exponents. So here what we have is c times e to the i, and that's a common factor, so I'll pull it out, times kx minus omega t. Now that should start to look a little bit familiar. We have this kx minus omega t thing going on. All right, so let's take this a little bit further. We have to do a little bit of math here, but it's not too bad. We have something called Euler's identity, which we're going to bring into the picture. This says that for any angle theta whatsoever, e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. This is a really famous result in math. I'm not going to attempt to prove it here or anything, but it relates exponential functions to uh, sinusoidal functions in a really nice way. And it also involves complex numbers. Okay, 
So we just said that for a particle moving in the positive x direction, we have big psi, capital psi of x and t is equal to c times e to the i kx minus omega t. So what we want to do is think of this, the kx minus omega t, as our theta in Euler's identity. Okay, And so what we have is c times cosine kx minus omega t. That's the cosine theta part. And then plus i times sine kx minus omega t. That's how we can expand this whole thing out in terms of sines and cosines. All right. If we have a particle moving in the opposite direction, moving in the negative x direction, this will just look like big psi of x and time is equal to c times e to the i kx plus omega t. So remember, we've dealt with sinusoidal waves before. If you have a minus omega t, that's a wave moving in the positive x direction. And if you have a plus omega t, that's a wave moving in the negative x direction. So th this should look familiar, right? And when we expand this all out using Euler's identity, we have c times cosine kx plus omega t, and then plus i times sine kx minus omega t. All right, so what does this look like? It's a little complicated at first, but we have a wave function that has a real component and an imaginary component, okay? And so the real component is the part that doesn't have this i in it. That's the cosine, okay? So for the real component, we just have a cosine function. And for the imaginary component, we have this sine function. So both the real and the imaginary parts are sine waves. One of them is just sort of offset from the other, right? But other than that, they look pretty much the same, okay? So that's how you want to think about this. We have a real part of the wave function. We have an imaginary part of the wave function. But each one of those just looks like a familiar sine wave that we've seen in the past. Okay, now I'm going to show you what this looks like, not only when we plot it out, but when we animate it. Because remember, this is something that depends not only on x, but on time. So if we really want to see what's going on, we need to show a plot, but animate it so it's changing over time. All right, so what's going on here? We have the x-axis going this way. On this axis, I'm showing you the imaginary part of our wave function. And on this axis, I'm showing you the real part of our wave function. So let me play the animation for you. This is a free particle moving in the positive x direction. So notice how our wave here is moving in the positive x direction. But since we have a wave for the real part and for the imaginary part, and they're out of phase with each other, right? Because one of them is a cosine and the other one is a sine, you end up getting this type of behavior. It's a sort of a helix. It's a spiral that's moving through space, okay? Now, I would have the exact same kind of thing for a free particle moving in the minus x direction. Uh, that would just be a helix moving in the opposite way. So it's pretty interesting, right? You get this sort of helical motion for your wave function uh, as it moves through space, okay? So we're going to end it with this. This is a question for the class. The wave function of a free particle is given below. And all quantities that you see are in SI units. So we have capital Psi as a function of X and T is equal to C times E to the I times 251X minus 945 T. So a couple of questions about this. What is the wavelength lambda and the frequency F of this particle's wave function? Is the particle moving in the positive X or the negative X direction? Then after we've done that, we're going to calculate the momentum of the particle, and we're going to calculate the energy of the particle. We're going to have to know Planck's constant in order to do some of these calculations, so that's given over here. All right, so pause the video, see if you can work this out, and I just want to remind you or give you a hint that this right here is k, and this right here is omega. So if you remember how k and omega relate to the wavelength and the frequency, you can get pretty far in this problem. So 
pause the video, try to work it out, and then uh, we'll do it together. Okay, so let's write down what we have. We have big psi of x and t equals c times e to the i. Uh, and in general, what is the form of this? We have kx minus or plus omega t. That's the general form. Now, in our specific case, we have c times e to the i times 251 times x minus 945 times t. Okay, so right off the bat, because there's a negative sign here, okay, we have minus omega t, we know that we're moving in the positive x direction. Okay, so that's given right off the bat. And so the next thing we can do is calculate the wavelength. So here we're going to use the relationship k is 2 pi divided by lambda. That's our wave number. And so lambda, the wavelength, is 2 pi divided by k. Well, what's k? That's the 251, right? And we're asked to assume that that's in SI units, so that would be radians per meter. So we want to think of this as 2 pi radians divided by 251 radians per meter. That's our lambda. Okay, so if you calculate that, you will get 0 0.025 and then 0 0.03 meters, which is the same as 2.50 centimeters. So that's the wavelength of this wave function. Okay. Now, we also know that omega is equal to 2 pi times f. And what that gives us is f equals omega over 2 pi. And we know the value of omega. That's this 945 number. Uh, and again, we're supposed to assume that that's in SI units. So that's like radians per second, right? So we have um, 945 radians per second divided by 2 pi radians. And we just end up getting inverse seconds as our units. So that's 150.4 inverse seconds. And we can round that to a nice 150 hertz. Okay. So now we know the wavelength and the frequency. We can calculate based on that what the energy is. Remember, the energy of a particle is equal to h bar times omega, where that's the angular frequency. Well, we know what omega is because it's right there in the wave function. So what do we have? For h bar, that's 1 over 2 pi times h. So I'm dividing out the 2 pi, and then h is 6.626, 10 to the minus 34, and that's in units of joules times seconds. Okay, and then uh, what do we have next to that? We have omega, that's 945 radians per second. Okay, so this comes out to 9.97, 10 to the minus 32 joules. So because we know the frequency, we automatically know the energy. That's the way that works. And then finally, we can calculate the momentum, P. Because the momentum, according to the de Broglie relationship, is h over lambda. And since we just found lambda, we can plug it in. So we have 6.626, 10 to the minus 34. And let me just remind you about the units for h for Planck's constant. It's joules times seconds. But a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. But if we multiply that by seconds, then we just get seconds on the bottom, okay? So that, that's another unit for h. Okay, and if we divide that whole thing by the wavelength, we have 0 0.02503 units of meters. So the final unit we get is kilograms times meters per second. That's what we expect for momentum. Remember, should be a mass times a velocity sort of thing. So that works. And what you get is 2.65, 10 to the minus 32 kilograms meters per second. So again, since we know the wavelength, we can get the momentum fairly straightforwardly, just like this.
All right, so that's gonna be it for this video. We're gonna do more examples of cases where we can solve the Schrodinger equation in the next video. So I'll see you then.